Good afternoon, everyone. Those of us that are here, most of us are likely stuffed to the gills oh with goodness. fish, no pun intended. Uh, and it was delicious. Thank you to everyone that cooked it, that prepared it, that helped clean up, helped serve. Uh, in any way, shape, or form, if you participated, thank you so much. Uh, your service was appreciated, and we have fared sumptuously. Now we're going to try to push Brother Brad to the test to see if he, with a belly full of fish, can <laughs> preach tonight. We've enjoyed his session so far, and we look forward to another session. Uh, for those of us that are here in person or, or joining us online, if you have questions about anything that's presented tonight or in any of the previous sessions, uh, write those questions down. If you're joining us online, please put those questions on our Facebook or YouTube um, uh, streams and we'll get those and we'll be able to forward them to him and he'd be happy to address those questions that are relevant to the topics uh, for this evening. Uh, we have two sessions left tonight and tomorrow morning at 930. So if you're available, please come, please show up, please bring your questions, invite your friends and family members. The things that have been said so far are extremely beneficial, I think, to any family, uh, no matter where you live. If you want to grow spiritually, I think that you can have uh, some equipment to help you do so. Uh, so without uh, any more, we'll have an opening prayer by Brother Boyce Barger, and the next voice after that will be Brother Brad here.
Let's pray. Holy and divine Father, uh, Lord, we are so grateful for this time that we have to uh, gather with the saints, to worship you, to serve you, Father. And we pray that our uh, worship to you tonight will be uh, according to your will, that it will be humbly uh, presented to you and that you will uh, find it uh, to be appropriate and acceptable. Father, we are uh, so very grateful for these lessons that remind us of the uh, exceedingly important uh, nature of the family, Father. We understand that the, uh, as the nation, as the families go, so go the nations, so go the church. And uh, if the families are disrupted as they are, Father, by purposely designed, evilly designed plans to disrupt um, the family as you designed it, as you created it, Father, we pray for the failure of those plans, Father, though they have been uh, successful in so many ways so far, we pray that they uh, may, may be turned around. Uh, and that that father will be as a result of uh, the preaching, the teaching of the gospel message in its, in its uh, fullness. Father, we pray for our president. We pray for his wife at this time as they are di diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. We pray that they will uh, uh, not suffer, and that they will have a strong recovery, that they, be, they, they will be healthy, and that they will soon return to their rightful places and that, that uh, and th that they will be well. We pray, Father, again, that you'll be with us throughout this service. Uh, we pray that we will uh, be thoughtful as we listen, that we will apply these principles uh, that we hear uh, very thoughtfully and carefully, and that we will share them with others. Forgive our sins, Father, as we look into our own hearts and compare it to the things that we find there to the things written in your word as we repent of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So I thought it would be fitting tonight to talk about Jonah being thrown up by a fish. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I do want to kind of pick up where we left off this afternoon. So for those of you who weren't here this afternoon, I, I apologize. I'm not going to go all the way back. But I am going to give you guys some application that you can take home, that you can feed to your children, your grandchildren, because sometimes people say, okay, I want to do what we're talking about, but I, I, I don't really know what to do. And so I'm going to give you about three slides full of information that all come from the book of Proverbs. And so these are basically three slides full of attributes, Christian character type topics that you can go home, you can take these scriptures, and you can talk to your kids about things like diligence, kindness, generosity, things that our young people need to be basically clued in on, but they're not getting this in a school classroom in too many cases. Self-control, righteousness, truthfulness, honesty discretion in choosing their friends. Anybody think that might be an important thing? Caution, prudence, gentleness. Or how about this one? Contentment, which is a very biblical principle. Integrity of character, humility, graciousness. Again, all of these are coming from the book of Proverbs. One more slide to, to kind of key you in more. So if I'm a parent, I can do this one of two ways. I, I can either do a topic each night and say, hey, tonight, you know what? We're, we're going to talk about purity or, or we're going to talk about patience. And we can hone in on that particular passage. Or there's roughly 31 chapters in Proverbs, right? How, how many days in a month normally? 30 or 31, right? So another approach that I could take if I'm a parent is say, all okay, right, we're going to read a chapter of Proverbs every single night as a family together, one per night of the month. So for instance, if you're on the fourth day of the month, you read Proverbs 4, kind of stay on track that way and just kind of keep repeating. You'll be surprised how much your kids can pull from that 
as a learning opportunity. The other thing that I'm going to throw out to you, had we had loads of time this weekend and had Stephen given me one more slot to fill, I would have spent at least an hour talking about marriage. Why would I talk about marriage when we're talking about families and, and parenting? And I'll I, I tell you why, because folks, if we don't get our marriage right, then there's a good chance that our home's not going to be right. So let me just toss up the $64,000 question to you. You're not going to get the full marriage lesson, but you are going to get the question. And that question is this, does your marriage bring other people closer to Christ? Now think about that. Let me say it one more time. Does your marriage, and by that I mean your actions, your, your words to your spouse, is that drawing other people closer to Jesus? Because the reality in Benton, Arkansas, is there's a lot of people who the only sermon they're going to hear this coming week is when two Christians sit down at a table, and maybe they're a waiter or waitress, and the sermon that they hear is between a Christian husband and a Christian wife. I'll remind everybody in this room. Book of Revelation talks about when Jesus is going to come back and claim his bride. Guess what? That hadn't happened yet. And so the only picture the lost world has of the relationship between Jesus and his bride, the church, is a married couple in the church. Do you see that? We, we are supposed to exhibit the love that Jesus has for his bride. We're supposed to show that in our homes to our spouse. So let me encourage you, if that is an area that you need to work on, spend some time working there. And I promise you, husbands and wives in this room, if you don't take date nights, if you don't feed and, and fertilize your marriage, please start doing it. And you say, well, I can't, you know, my, my kids are, are young, we, we can't do it right now. I would say you can't afford not to do it. Because your children really need to see you putting that marriage where it's supposed to be. Giving it the priority it needs to have. This evening we're going to talk a, a, about a, another topic that I think is absolutely invading the home. If I throw out the name Thomas Jefferson... Probably everybody in this room recognizes Thomas Jefferson's name. They, you know, he was a president, a founding father. But what you probably do not know is Thomas Jefferson had a very unique copy of the Bible. This is a picture of it. And unlike your Bible, you notice his has got some places missing. And the reason was... If Thomas Jefferson didn't like what he said, he literally cut it out. So, for instance, Thomas Jefferson didn't like the idea of hell. So, he come across a Bible passage that talked about hell, guess what he'd do? He'd get out his scissors or a pen knife. He, he didn't want a, a God that, that had wrath. So, what did he do? He would cut it out. This evening, I want to ask the question, is it possible that we have in a metaphorical way done the exact same thing. And by that I mean, is it possible there are scriptures that we purposefully don't want to deal with? So we either skip over them, maybe we mentally cut them out. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, let's take a look at verse 15 together. Bible says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, friends, let me make sure you guys understand. This is one of those passages. You don't have to go to the Memphis School of Preaching to figure this one out. Okay, You, you don't have to spend four years in a seminary. You, you don't have to know the, the Greek and... In fact, let me just tell you what he's really saying. What he's saying is, don't love the world. And yet, this is not one of those passages that we put on our walls, is it? We, we don't stitch this into a pillow and, and put it around our house. 
Because quite honestly, this one may get a little bit too close to our own toes. So this evening, what I want us to do is I want to diagnose the cardiology of worldliness. I say cardiology because at the root of it, it really is a heart issue. If I were to ask you guys, how do you define worldliness? What would you say? Basically, it is this. It is a love for the fallen world. I need to make sure you get that. Okay? Because what we are experiencing today is by no means what God wanted us to experience. The original plan was that we would be in this awesome place and God would be with us. Get a hold of that for just a minute, okay? Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, God actually walked through the midst of the garden with Adam, with Eve. You know what that means? That means they never had to think, am I going to heaven? Because they were already in the presence of God. They didn't have to pray about being sick or dying because there was no death. There was no sickness. There was no sin. Sin ruined it. And now we are in a fallen world. The problem is Satan has tempted us with all this stuff of the fallen world and said, hey, you know, this is a great place. What does it mean to be worldly? Does it mean that, that I can't go watch an R-rated movie? Or does it mean that, that I can't drive a certain kind of car? Or, or does it mean that I may have to change my, the music I listen to? Does it mean that I, I can't have a vacation home or, or have a big John Deere tractor? It's interesting. We all know the questions. But the real question is, do we honestly want someone to answer some of those questions? Again, if you've got your Bible, look at the very next verse, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, because he points out the fact that this really is a heart issue. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Basically, what he's trying to say here is this. It's not a certain name brand, okay? Not a certain car. It's not a, a certain type of clothing or, or a particular handbag. He's saying, look, three things. You've got lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I tell people, it's not that you want something, it's that you want it too much. So much so that it starts interfering with your relationship with God. Because now all of a sudden that becomes a central focal point in your life. It's very interesting. If I were in lots of places in the world... I would not be delivering this sermon right here because there are a lot of places where they don't have a whole lot. But for some reason in America, there is this sense that you can be Christian and you can have this deep burning desire for stuff, for worldliness. And yet the scripture says exactly the opposite. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you and I attest this evening, okay? If I were to blindfold myself and I asked you to bring into one of the Bible classrooms back here, bring one of your, your worldly friends, maybe somebody you, you work with, an extended family member, somebody who basically doesn't darken the doors of a, a church building ever, right? I set you down at a, at a table. We've got paper. We've got pencils there. And I'll start asking both of you questions. And I ask questions like, what internet websites do you like to go to? What, what's your favorite movie? Who's your favorite artist? 
What, what do you like to, to listen to on your phone? Or, or, or what, what kind of clothes do you like to wear? How do you spend your free time? What's your favorite TV show? And I just keep asking away. Both of you writing things down. We get to the end of the questions. Both of you slide your papers to the center of the table. I take off the blindfold. Let me ask you, would I be able to discern which one of you was a Christian and which one of you was not? Would I be able to actually pick out your coworker, your extended family member? Because folks, there's so many people out there that think the world is offering everything that we forget scripture says the opposite. It, it doesn't hold anything in the end. The very next verse of that passage, 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, the world is passing away, the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. How would it feel if, if every time you went shopping, there was two price tags, right? One that gave you the price of the item and one that reminded you this is going to burn up one day. Because according to scripture, it is. Best analogy I've ever heard on worldliness is this one. Think of yourself as a boat. Now, a boat is designed to be on the water, right? So the world is actually the water. What happens, though, when the water gets inside the boat? Folks, it is no longer useful for what it was made, right? You are a boat, and yes, you're going to be out in the world, but you don't need to let the world get in you. And here's the reality. Right now, some of you in this room, some of you realize that water has gotten in your boat. And so maybe every three or four months, here's what you do. You, you take stock of your life. You bail out some of the water. The thing that bothers me, that troubles me, is there some of you, you've known that water's getting in your boat for a long, long time, and you stop bailing. Take a look at Amos chapter 6, verse 1. Amos chapter 6, verse 1. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. Woe to those who are at ease. Woe to those who have stopped bailing. And little by little, your boat has filled up. Every single moment of every day, here's what's happening. You and I are making choices about whether we are going to love the world, a world that opposes God, or are we going to love Christ? In fact, let's see how this battle really plays out. Turn in your Bible to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and let me encourage moms and dads in this room, circle it, highlight it, put an asterisk by it. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Notice what he calls us here. He says, adulterers and adulteresses. He's saying, you've left your first love. But then notice what he says. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of who? Of God. Now folks, I, I realize there's a lot of things that go into childproofing a home. Okay? Some of you guys in this room right now, you can go home, you got the little 
things over your light sockets, you got cabinet protectors, all this kind of stuff. Please understand there are few things as dangerous in your home as raising up children who love the world. Because what we just read says this, if your children love the world, they are an enemy of God. And that's serious. All right. Do we have any, any biblical examples of what we're talking about? Like, like, is there anybody in Scripture that we could learn from in this area? Like, for instance, what about a guy named Demas? You guys know Demas. In fact, some of you in this room, you are like Demas. Demas was on fire for the Lord. He, he actually went on mission trips with Paul. He wanted to see the kingdom grow. And so Paul, as he often did in his letters, as he was closing them out, he would reference people who were either traveling with him, people who maybe he, he longed to see. And you'll notice Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. He says, Luke, the, <coughs> the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Book of Philemon talks about this same guy. So here is a guy, he's on fire for the Lord, he's going on mission campaigns, and then in one of Paul's very last letters, 2 Timothy chapter 4, pick up in verse 9, be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. All right, let me tell you what I, I, when I read a passage like that, what immediately goes through my head, I immediately think to myself, all right, was this dude married? Did, did he have children? And if so, did he pull his wife and children into the world with him? Because please understand, this isn't a situation where you, you wake up one day and, and Demas says, you know what, I'm done, I'm just going out into the world. Now what happened is he allowed water to start getting into his boat and he stopped bailing. Here you had a guy, a follower of Christ, close companion to Paul, willing to risk everything for the gospel who eventually ended up out in the world. By the way, let's make sure we understand the sermon, this lesson is not just for young people. It's for all ages. Because at the end of the day, young and old alike need to understand every day the world is trying to tempt you. And by the way, Satan knows exactly what each one of you need or want. I'll give you an example. If Satan were to try to tempt me with shoes... I would laugh at him. Oh my goodness. I would be like, seriously? My wife, on the other hand, we can go, this is not an embellishment right here, folks. We could go into tractor supply and somehow she ends up in the shoe section. Okay? I mean, we could be going for dog food and suddenly we're looking at shoes because they're on sale. I told her one time, I said, you're having an affair. She said, what are you talking about? I said, this guy named Clearance. Every time I turn around, you're with Clearance. <laughs> Shoes? Oh, yeah. Me? Not so much. Now, you throw something like tractors, guns, something else. My wife, would, she wouldn't even blink at that. Her husband, on the other hand? Yeah. So how do we fix it? How, how do we make sure that every person in this room stays centered where we need to be? Ultimately, what we got to do is we got to go back to the cross. In fact, take a look. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says this, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. So how do I, Brad Harab, how do I, I try to protect myself from being worldly? How do I make sure I'm not getting a bunch of water in my boat 
ultimately I got to focus on the cross. And I got to realize that a lot of the stuff out there, that's what put Jesus on the cross. Some of the shows that we're watching, church, some of the activities that we enjoy, that's what's putting him on the cross. So let me ask you this evening, can you love the nails that were put into his hands? Or can you bless the hammer that hammered those nails home? Can you kiss the hands that, that put that crown of thorns on his head? Because ultimately, when you say that you're a disciple of Christ, and then you go out and love the world, what you're doing is you're crucifying him afresh. What we've got to do, we've got to understand Every person in this room has been bought with a price. And we now serve him. I was in a, a creation evolution seminar one weekend and I had a, an atheist. He just was sure he was going to get me. Open it up for questions. He said, uh, so you support slavery? I knew what he was wanting to do. He, he was wanting to kind of fight and, and argue about like civil war type slavery. That was kind of what he was. He thought the Bible actually supported it. It doesn't. I can share that with you if you want to talk about it. But I looked at him and I said, oh, absolutely. And his eyes got real big because he was not expecting me to say, yeah. I said, absolutely. I'm so thankful to be able to be a slave for Jesus Christ. Because that's what I'm called to be, right? We have been bought with a price. And so as a result, here's what that means. That means ultimately everything you do needs to be examined under the lamp of God's word. So this evening what I want to do, I want to hit you with four areas that I think worldliness is invading our lives. And when I say our, I'm talking about our lives. I will go ahead and warn you right up front. I'm going to spend the most time with the first one because I think it's probably the area in which we're getting hit the most. That is with media. Anybody in this room think that maybe we get a little bit of worldliness through media? <laughs> let, let, let me break it down for you this way. Anybody in this room think that you absorb a lot of media in 24 hours? Let's take the average American. You wake up, most of you wake up to a, an alarm clock, a phone going off. You go about your normal routine. If you're over the age of 60, maybe you look at a newspaper. If you're under 60, you're flipping through your phone, catching the headlines. You get in your car, you drive to the office, where all along the way you're, you're listening to maybe a talk show or, or some shock jock on the radio. You get to work, you go through your work emails. Maybe about 10 o'clock you, you knock off for a break. You go into a break room, grab some coffee. There's a, a 24 hour news station on the TV right there. Somewhere around lunch, you grab your phone, you start texting family members. Somewhere around about three, four o'clock, you realize, ah, I'm supposed to pick up the kids. So you jump in the car, you, you head off to their school. Now, you got young kids, so here's what happens. Within about 11 seconds of them jumping into your vehicle, there's a screen that drops down, and suddenly the latest Pixar film is playing in the back of your car. You get home, you grab a remote, and you've got 387 channels at your disposal. Most of which are rubbish, by the way. You do knock off for dinner. You, you go, you gather with your family, but then after that, here's what happens. A lot of times you just kind of veg out in front of a TV, watching the latest reality show, and finally you drift off to sleep listening to the evening news. Do you have any idea how much media you just soaked in that day? By the way, most of it, was not from a Christian worldview. How much media do we consume? How much is it affecting our lives? Take a look. This is a quote from a guy by the name of Ken Myers. He, he wrote a book many years ago called 
all of God's children and blue suede shoes. I'm going to give him credit for having one of the most unique titles of a book. Here's what he says. Not all citizens of Christendom were Christians. Now he's talking about in the past, right? He says, but all understood it. All were influenced by its teaching. He said, I can think of no entity today capable of such a culturally unifying role except television. In television, we live, we move, and we have our being. More recently, Kent Hughes wrote a book called Set Apart, calling a worldly church to a godly life in which he said this, Today, the all-pervasive glow of the television set is the single most potent influence and control in Western culture. He said, television has greater power over the lives of most Americans than any educational system, government, or church. Now, I would update his quote to say, television and the internet have a whole lot of control. And you say, ah, Brad, it, it doesn't control me. Anybody in this room ever maybe been talking to somebody and, and you say, you know, we really need to paint our, our, our spare bedroom. And you get on Facebook and all of a sudden ads start popping up. You know what those ads are for? Sherwin-Williams, Porter Paints, Home Depot. And you realize, wow, man, I, I need to go on and get some paint. Or how about this? Anybody in this room think that maybe television controls what you wear? Most of you right now are like, no, I don't control what I wear. Okay, all of you older kids in this room, I want you to ask your parents if they ever wore parachute pants or like a single glove or a jacket that had metal on it right here, okay? If they're old enough, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Most of us don't think actively about what we're taking in yeah, okay, well, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to avoid pornography, but do we actually think about what we're watching and the worldview that it's bringing? Or do we just veg out? Please understand, if my children were here, they would tell you, I'm not one of these people that says, hey, just go up and blow up your TV, okay? Might not be a bad idea, but my children will tell you, occasionally I like to watch football games, I like to do different things on TV, but what happens when we stop thinking about what we're putting in right up here? If I asked you guys, what did Jesus say was the greatest command? You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. What's number three? With all of your mind. Glorifying God is an intentional pursuit. And here's what that means. That means every single day you have to wake up and think to yourself, today I want to be closer to him. I want to do better. I, I can't watch that. I can't read that. I can't listen to that anymore. And you're making choices every single day to try to be more holy. In his book, Ken Meyer says this, he says, I believe that the challenge of living with popular culture may well be as serious for modern Christians as persecution and plagues were for the saints of earlier centuries. He said, enemies that come loudly and visibly are usually much easier to fight than those that are undetectable. And he's right. Because folks, I promise you, if I came to your house tonight, I knocked on your door at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, Hey, I'm Satan. I'm here for the heart and mind of your children. First off, most of you probably shoot me. But you wouldn't let me in, would you? But you will pick up a remote control and let him in. Three areas that you need to think about when it comes to media. The first is time. God has given you a limited number of days on this earth. You are to be a steward with those. So question number one, am I skipping or delaying something important in order to watch this now? Number two, what are my other social or entertainment options besides watching TV, going out, seeing a movie? Number three, how much time have I already spent on media today? 
Number four, how much time have I spent surfing the internet or on social media? How about number five? Check it out. In the last week, how much time have I spent on spiritual growth, rebuilding or building relationships, serving at church compared to time spent consuming media? And after investing this time to view this, am I going to look at it as time well spent? So the first area that I want everybody to think about is time. The second is, how is it going to affect your heart? Number one, why do I want to watch this program or film? What, what do I find entertaining about it? Am I seeking to escape something that I should be facing by watching this? A am I seeking comfort or relief that can only be found in God? What sinful temptations will this program or film present? Do I secretly want to view something in it that's sinful? And am I watching this because I'm bored or lazy? And if so, folks, what does that say about us? Last but not least, am I watching this simply because other people are? Am I just trying to fit in? So, time is one area. Your heart what about the content? When you decide, yeah, I'm going to watch that movie, I'm going to watch that TV show, ask yourself, what worldview or philosophy does that program present? Or, more importantly, what does this film glamorize? Let me throw this out there. A lot of you in this room, a lot of you in this room, actually were rooting for a prostitute to hook up with somebody she wasn't married to. And you look at me and you say, I would never do that. Ever heard of a movie called Pretty Woman? Oh, yeah. What was Julia Roberts' career? Oh, she was a streetwalker. And by the end of the movie, Hollywood had you rooting that they would get together. Now, let me point out something to you. They weren't married. Is sin shown in a, as a, having a negative consequence? What is the, the sexual content? Would seeing this help me better understand God's world? Will I benefit in any way from watching this or visiting this website? Is the language in this film glorifying to God? Three areas that I hope each and every one of you will think about. Time, heart, content. Because otherwise, here's what happens. If we just sit in front of a screen and, and we put it on and, and we veg out, oftentimes we start having our conscience dulled. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 talks about having your conscience seared with a hot iron. I can look at you and say, America as a nation has most definitely been through this. And the reason I can say that for sure, there was a movie that came out before I was born that was considered a scandal when it came out. The reason? It had one cuss word in it. It's a movie called Gone with the Wind. And it was scandalous. In a major movie, they're going to put a cuss word. Do you realize we have cuss words in commercials now? We have cuss words in PG movies. So do I think maybe our conscience has been seared? Yeah. I challenged my home congregation. And let me just tell you, I, I don't let up on them, okay? If some of you are sitting out there going, man, this dude is tough. I, I give them twice as much, okay? Mainly because I'm on the road so much they don't see me. I told him, I said, I want you to write two Latin words and put it on your bathroom mirror, put a, a, a post it on your computer. The two words are Coram Deo. It's Latin. And, and basically translated, it means this, before the face of God or, or in the presence of God. And I told them, I said, look, we should be living our lives, entire lives, Coram Deo. Everything we watch, everything we do, everything we see ought to be Coram Deo. Psalm 101, take a look. Starting in verse 2, I'll behave wisely in a perfect way. 
Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I will hate the work of those who fall away. If there is an elderly person in this room who is looking for something to do in this church family, let me encourage you, take that verse, write it out, put it on a, a card, and give a copy of it to every family in this church. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. And ask them to just tape that by their television. Now, I, I told you guys, Four areas, and I also told you I was going to spend the most time on the first one. The second one is music. Can music affect us? Yeah. It, it can affect us in a, a good way. I don't know if you guys sing this song. There's a song that when we sing it in my home congregation, it'll make the hair on your arm stand up. It's called The Greatest Command. And when all four parts come in on that song, man, it sound, it's awesome. You're listening to the words. You're thinking about it. But just like songs can have a positive effect, they can also have a very negative effect. And so as faithful Christians, we've got to start thinking about what are the lyrics that are going in my ears or my children's ears. And as you think about that, Take a look, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this. He says, for you once were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. It is shameful, he says. So area number two that I want you to think about is music. Number three, what about stuff? Can we be worldly with our stuff? Coveting has been defined as desiring stuff too much. Materialism is what happens when coveting has cash, right? Right? Most of you in this room, you know, you've seen a picture like this one where you got a guy, he's riding the back of a donkey trying to get him to go a certain way. What you may not realize, though, is that donkey's you, okay? And that's Satan. He's riding your back, and he is trying to tempt you with whatever he thinks will lead you away from Christ. And as a result, we have filled up our homes with stuff rather than filling up our lives with Christ. Let me throw this out. Let you chew on it when you go home tonight. You know what the number one money-making thing was about 15 years ago? It wasn't stock. If you really wanted to make money about 15 years ago, you invested in these storage facilities. You know these places where you, you pay money, people rent the little storage buildings and Oh, man, the, the thing was, time-wise, they figured out that the boomers and the next generation, they bought houses, they filled them up with stuff, they didn't have any more room. And so we were building all these storage facilities all across the United States. And people would put it, all their stuff in those things, pay three fifty dollars a month, you know, store it, whatever. So then they could go out and buy more what? <laughs> stuff, Right? It became a cycle. And usually the stuff that went in that storage facility, they didn't touch for 15, 20 years. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either hate the one and love the other, or else to be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot love God and mammon. Mammon just being a, an autonomy for self, for money. So when you think about worldliness... Water getting in your boat, you got to ask yourself, am I allowing stuff to become between me and God? The final area, and we could talk about several, but the final one I want to mention tonight, what about clothing? Can clothing pull us into the world? What about modest apparel? Now let me point out right up front, 
I believe males and females can be immodest. And I'm one of those really weird guys that thinks immodesty isn't just about length and tightness. I think immodesty is about drawing attention to yourself when God should be the one getting the attention. Okay? I'm going to read to you guys a, a portion of an article that I wrote about a, oh, probably a year, two years ago. You can find the whole thing online, but let me kind of set it up for you. Basically, it starts out talking about a, an older gentleman, maybe 60, 70, pulling into the church parking lot, just like this one, right? All he has on his mind is worshiping God. Sunday morning, he pulls in, he's on time, and right about the time he gets out of the car, there's a young lady in the youth group who gets out in front of him, and she's wearing something about three sizes too tight. This young lady had no idea that on this particular day she would cause a similar internal battle in over 25 males, age 11 to 87, all of whom had gathered to worship and honor God. She never realized that some of the men in the congregation had purposefully selected a pew or angled themselves with a clear line of sight to her backside. Or did she? She didn't realize that two or three of the men sitting behind her would later go home and feed their porn addictions while substituting mental images of her for the actress on the screen. Did she have any inkling that she was being devoured in the minds of men who were supposed to be worshiping God? And did she care? So another area where the world can invade our homes is with how we dress. If I were to ask you tonight, what, what do your eyes chase or what does your heart long for? It's my hope and my prayer in this room that every single one of us will go back, will reflect on what Paul wrote, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, when he said, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, he says, think on these things. And that is my hope and prayer for each and every one of you. That rather than getting wrapped up in the world, that you'll think on those things. In fact, if you really want to beat worldliness, focus on the cross. So here's my hope and my prayer for this congregation. It is my hope and prayer that this year we will repent of worldliness. I notice I say repent. Sometimes Christians, we think of that word and we think, oh, no, man, that's, that's like one of the acts of five things you got to do for it. You know, you got to believe, you got to hear, confess, you got to repent, and then you're baptized, right? I did all that. I'm, I'm good. And yet, then we flip over to Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus was writing to the churches in Asia. You remember? And in almost every one of those cases, do you know what he told the Christians in those congregations to do? He said, repent. Change your ways. So my hope, my prayer is that we will repent of worldliness, turn our focus to Christ and to God's word. I'm going to pause right there because I do want to give you a, a few minutes, comments, questions, thoughts, share ideas. The floor is yours. And so tonight, if y'all don't ask me questions, I'm going to start asking you questions. Okay. Yeah. First, we're struggling with the world Can you give us maybe two things, practical things, we can start Two things, okay, he said, what if, we're, what if we're struggling with worldliness? Practically speaking, what are two things that we could do tomorrow? First thing I would encourage everybody in this room to do, go home and look at your DVD collection. Or go home and, and think about what you've been streaming. And if it's not wholesome, get rid of it. Same thing with, with music. If it's not wholesome to God, 
have the backbone to get rid of it. Chuck it, throw it away, take it off your, your phone, take it off your DVR, because that, that's actually one of the more simple things that you can do. Take that out of your mind and your heart. That would be number one. Same thing with even books. Um, I'm about to go from preaching to meddling right here, as some ladies say. There are some novels, romance-type novels, that Christians do not need to be reading. Okay? Let me remind you, who instituted marriage? God did. Okay? It, it is a good thing. It is not a good thing to be reading books that mess with God's institution. So if you've got romance novels at home that are treating marriage the wrong way, or if you've got Fifty Shades of Grey or even grayer or whatever the grays are, I don't even know, get rid of them. Because that's not stuff that we need to be putting into our hearts and our minds. That'd be the first thing. Second thing, if I'm a parent, I'm going to sit down and challenge my children tomorrow. And I'm going to say, hey, what are some things that maybe you can either donate to somebody who has, who, who doesn't have a whole lot of stuff? Or what are some things that maybe you can do without that maybe you've been, been spending either too much time with or that have been taking your time away? Or, or maybe what are some things that you've been messing around with that quite literally they're affecting your attitude? Maybe they, they make you not be as friendly to your friends, or maybe you have a hard time sharing with them. And I'm going to ask them to give it up. Donate some of that stuff to families that are less fortunate. Um, that would be two that immediately come to mind. Obviously, anytime you can use what we're talking about and jump into God's Word, that's, that is the thing. You know, the more time you can get your family gathered around together and jump into the, the Word, the better. Good question. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Right, we can see the concept of eating junk food physically. We eat carbs, and sugary sweets, candy, baked goods. What's going to happen? You're going to be unhealthy. You're not going to feel well, you're not going to look well, you're just not good. Yep. Okay, same thing with our spiritual diet. If you can feed yourself with just spiritual junk, not, not even spiritual, but just, just junk, just keep on feeding that spiritual body nothing but junk food, it's going to be nothing but bad. Absolutely. I, I love, I'm looking around in the room and I see younger folks, which I love, by the way. I love it when they're in here with their parents. Um, train them now to start going to websites like kidsinmind.com or pluggedin.com. These are, are sites that actually will review both movies and television. And some of them will actually give you, in fact, let me see if I can, if y'all bear with me for just a second, I'll probably show you guys. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here we go. So these are websites free of charge that you can go to and they actually will give you reviews of all kind of stuff. Do what? Oh no, I'm, I'm still scrolling. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it up there and just, uh, here we go. All right. So here's, here's kids in mind. Um, you'll notice, I don't have a pointer, <laughs> so you'll notice it's got the movie name Dunkirk in this instance. And then it gives three numbers, zero, six, and five. And what that represents, if you go over here to the right, first number, how much sex and nudity is in that particular movie. Second number, how much violence and gore. Third number, how much profanity? And it will actually, if you click on it, it'll actually tell you. It has this many, this, you know, S words, this many whatever words. So you know, before you ever walk into that movie theater, 
what it's got. Now, what I'm saying is don't just use this. Train your children to use this so that when they get older, um, they will actually, before they go watch movies, they'll actually look stuff up. You know, if you got a movie that's a six, seven, ten, like at the bottom, hopefully your kids don't even have to think about, you know what, I don't need to be going to that. Is there times where I might go see a movie that, that has a number that's higher? Like, what about something that has violence but has no sex nudity, no profanity? What about like a war movie? Would that... Yeah, there's been some movies that I've shown my kids. Even, I think, I don't have it on here, but probably Passion of the Christ. It's probably like a, I don't even know, uh, has no sex and nudity, but violence and gore would be like almost a 10, if not a 10. Here's my point. Help your children to see these particular websites so before they make the choice to go to a movie, they check it out themselves and realize, you know what, I, I don't need to go see that because it's got this many words or this kind of scenes in it. Junk food, just like he's saying. Good point. Other comments, questions? Yes, sir. I think one of the things that kids pick up on and very early age is consistency. Yeah. When they look at their parents, when they see parents, like your example last night, I thought I got hit home with the Smith family there. When you think of that family unit, they're more than likely that family unit that will try to make the church unless something else appeals to them that's a little bit better. For example, when it was being denied, how many kids have been denied their parents did not set the proper example? They said, well, we would go, but. But. And those kids pick up on that inconsistency there. Yeah. And they say, okay, well, it's not really important because mom and dad's just tired of up there. And so I think, like, the time when I went to the kids in the auditorium period shows consistency. Parents have said, absolutely. Putting this, above. this is important to me. I know there's some SEC football on tonight, but guess what? We're going to go. Um, I, I'm not picking on people because I don't know everybody's situation, but. Stephen caught me looking at the board out there earlier this evening at all the different faces. And part of the reason I was doing that was because I was trying to see who I will likely see tomorrow that I have yet to see this whole weekend. Um, there'll be some people here.